<laughs> so it's great to be here. Um, uh, what a wonderful day of, of talks and information. It's just been fantastic. Um, and we'll kind of end the day, I suppose, with a kind of a deeper delve into the question of what is driving this plasticity that we've heard about all today. And so we dive deep into the genome and come out and see what, what arises from, uh, from this, this interesting and evolving field of epigenetics. So uh, I guess to frame today's talk, um, my interest really comes in thinking about how the brain changes over time, how those brain changes confer differences in perception of the world, in social behavior, in cognition, um, and in thinking also about not just the general process of change, but how do we arrive at these different endpoints, right? We have different trajectories. We have, as, as uh, Baroness told us this morning, unique brains. That's what creates this unique identity uh, within us. So uh, in thinking about the process of how you get change over time in the brain uh, and unique profiles of brain development, um, of course, that brings us, as, as Mary uh, suggested in her introductory remarks, to this question of nature and nurture, right? So we, we hear about this in a lot of different contexts. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Three Identical Strangers. We, we had a viewing of it recently for our research ethics uh, symposium. Uh, but again, people are fascinated with the idea of the contribution of genes and of the contribution of environments to developmental outcomes. And this infiltrates biology, psychology, all different academic fields, um, because it's really addressing a central question of what is making me unique and, I, and, and, and different, and what is making me also similar to those around me. Um, so in thinking the theoretically about this nature-nurture question, we have a theoretical framework that looks something like this that I have on the screen. So the idea here is that, yes, there can be genetic impact on phenotype, which is any kind of characteristic you can think of. You can put in empathy, social behavior, health, depression, um, height, weight. All of these characteristics can have a genetic influence. But of course, we know that there is interplay between genes and environments, meaning that if that genome has different environmental exposures as it moves through life, you will get a different outcome in the end. So different phenotypic outcomes arising from a single genotype. And that is really the, the core elements of a gene-environment interaction, that, that there is knowing just one, knowing just genes isn't enough. We need to know the whole picture, the spectrum of the, of the different trajectories that this genome has gone through life to really be able to predict uh, what we'll get at the end. Now, I'd say up until uh, relatively recently, this has been the theoretical model. But the question is, well, we know what genes do generally. Um, I think we are learning more all the time with advances in molecular biology how genes operate. Uh, but how is it that an environment is shifting the actions of a gene? So what is the environment doing? How is it building on our biology to allow for these really uh, really dynamic and complex interactions between genes and environments. And that's really what brought us to epigenetics and epigenetic variation. And thinking about this intense molecular interplay as being a core concept, a core construct in building who we are and how we behave. So epigenetics actually has different meaning depending on who you're talking to. So the term is actually quite old, being originated uh, in the 60s by developmental biologists who really wanted to stress the idea that we need to think beyond just genes as determinants of behavior, but think of gene action and think of the process of development as rolling out over time, being dynamic and being modifiable and being driven by the expression of genes, not the presence of genes. 
Um, I would say that was the historic meaning, and anything that comes under the umbrella of not being determined by a gene sequence also can come under the definition of epigenetic. But I'd say for most people doing epigenetics in the field now, the, the definition has become a little bit more narrow to refer to the specific biology of what an epigenetic change is. Uh, and Jean highlighted uh, at least one of these epigenetic mechanisms, DNA methylation, which will certainly be, I think, the focus of, of some of the uh, studies I'll show you today. This is, again, a chemical modification of DNA. So we're going to add a chemical methyl group onto the DNA. It doesn't change the DNA sequence, but it can serve as an off switch, right? So we have our genes. They're still there. But now we've turned those genes off. And that's, I say, collectively what all of the epigenetic mechanisms are. They are on-off switches, right? We like to have all the information with, encoded within our genome. But we need to determine when that information is used and when it is suppressed. And that is what epigenetics allows us to do. Now, DNA methylation is certainly one of those. It has been the most studied because it is the most stable. Uh, it is the most amenable to study across species. Um, but there are other mechanisms as well. So there are histone modifications and microRNA. And I think as the field rolls forward, we'll think about different ways of measuring all of these wonderful things to capture kind of the, the dynamic nature of the epigenome. So thinking about the, the global scale of these kinds of changes. Now, I think intuitively, there was understanding that there must be more than just genes in driving behavior. Um, and that ironically comes from twin studies, which were designed to show that genes do have a very significant influence on developmental outcomes. So if we take monozygotic twins, for example, who share 100% of their genetic similarity, so they are identical in terms of their genes, we know that though they can be very, very similar in a lot of different traits, they are not the same, and they can differ in their disease risk, they can differ in their personality and their behavior. The question is how this occurs. And more and more evidence is suggesting that epigenetic variation, changes in DNA methylation, changes in histones, can confer differences between twins, and in fact might be induced by differential experiences of the twins. So back in 2004, when we started doing studies in animals to show that epigenetic variation did exist and was um, shaped and molded by the environment, there were uh, groups uh, in Spain looking at identical twins and measuring epigenetic changes in these twins, and they found found that young twins were very similar epigenetically to each other, and older twins were not. Now, this is not a longitudinal study. What we would love to be able to do is follow people throughout their life and characterize all the diversity of experiences that they have and see whether that shifts their epigenetic trajectories. Now, that wasn't possible at the time. There are more and more studies where this is now possible and where experiences such as bullying or stress that is unique to one twin is shown to have an epigenetic effect. But this original research suggested, of course, that variation in your epigenome emerges across the lifespan. And the inference was that if it is emerging across the lifespan, it is due to the environment. And this, I think, bolstered the idea that the way that environments are interacting with genes are through these processes, not through changing the DNA sequence, but by serving as an on-off switch for that wonderful genome that we have passed down across generations. Now, I've been very interested in exploring how environmentally induced epigenetic changes shift changes in the brain and behavior. And of course, we can think of a lot of different circuits that are relevant to a lot of different behaviors. And, and certainly, I think in the context of today's meeting, thinking about the cortical and subcortical circuits in the brain that are important for social behavior and aggression are kind of the topics, I think, that, that overlie nicely with a lot of what you'll hear at, at, at this meeting. Now, um, there are many, many circuits, many, many brain regions that are important for different elements of social behavior, of aggression, of, co of social cognition. Um, and so this here I've outlined just a few of the different networks that people are studying in terms of the social brain that will all be target to epigenetic 
uh, variation induced by the environment. So we have circuits that convey information about the social context. In order for me to behave appropriately in a, in a, in a social interaction, I have to take in cues about the context. What is the appropriate choice to make uh, in this interaction? I need to be able to uh, recruit systems that are involved in behaving in that context. And in some cases, perhaps that will lead to differences in defensive or aggressive behavior. And of course, a lot of this work is done in, in uh, mice that are extremely defensive and aggressive under a number of conditions. Now, what I'd like to do is show you a few illustrations of how we can think about environmental experiences, epigenetic variation, and the emergence of individual differences in brain and behavior. Now, a lot of this work started with thinking about mother-infant interactions, but I'm not going to start there because as we've progressed in the field, we realize that we need to go back further and further into developmental time and think prenatally about the origins of these individual differences. And even, I'd say, in a lot of the twin studies, people are now starting to think, oh, well, actually, the prenatal environment is not the same even for identical twins. And so it starts very, very early. So we've been doing a number of studies on prenatal stress, prenatal exposure to hormones, and prenatal endocrine disruption, how that affects the epigenome, how that affects circuits that are important for the social behavior and the social brain. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about caregiver interactions, particularly how these can be used to offset some of the changes that might be induced by the prenatal environment. And I'm going to end talking about multi-generational um, effects. Um, one of the reasons I started looking at multi-generational effects is because I was a really meticulous record keeper when I was a PhD, and I was tracking who gave birth to who and who gave birth to who for many generations in rats. Um, and just looking at it, and everyone thought that that was a really silly thing to do. But in the end, after you know a few years, I had data showing the consistency of caregiving activity and how the mother's care of her offspring affected their caregiving offspring toward caregiving behavior towards their offspring and so on. And you could see this over multiple generations. And I think certainly within the science of epigenetics, there's increasing realization that what matters for our offspring is not their own experiences, but also our experience as parents and our parents' experience, so going back many, many generations. Now, the prenatal period is a time of developmental plasticity, of developmental building of the brain. And we know from a number of epidemiological studies and experimental studies in animals that exposure to stress, exposure to immune activation, exposure to toxins and drugs uh, and mood and diet can have lasting effects on neurodevelopment and behavior. And we've been increasingly focused on this period and its effects uh, through uh, three particular lenses. So the first lens, of course, is thinking about epigenetics and thinking about where in the, in the genome you're going to get epigenetic effects of these kinds of experience, particularly DNA methylation. Second is thinking about how these effects might differ in males and females. It might not be a surprise to you that males and females are different. It is seemingly surprising for most researchers who've only been studying males in a lot of the preclinical studies. So now in, in the United States, the NIH actually forces people to study both males and females because they are, in fact, different. They respond differently to environments. Um, and in the case of the prenatal environment, a lot of sexual differentiation is occurring during that period, and exposure to stress, exposure to diet, exposure to differences in mood may affect that process and may then affect the whole process of sexual differentiation, but also um, uh, affect males and females differently. And this is a consistent theme in a lot of the work that we've done. The third lens that we've been looking at this is to think about the complexities of how you go from a prenatal environment to an outcome on infants and children. So there's what I'll call the direct path, right? So you have an exposure, a, a distress, even a nutritional distress, um, that can directly lead to epigenetic variation by pathways which I say are still kind of murky. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in understanding how we go from environment to epigenetic change. But then this leads to differences in fetal development, which uh, has uh, implications for infant outcomes. <clears throat> 
A second pathway is one that many, many groups now are exploring, is thinking about how environments prenatally affect the placenta. Now, the placenta is an extremely important regulatory organ during the prenatal period. It is basically controlling the flow of glucose and oxygen between the mother and fetus. It's controlling hormone exposure. It's controlling exposure to toxins. And changes in gene expression, changes in epigenetic variation in the placenta are going to be incredibly meaningful for predicting fetal and infant outcomes. And one of the, I think, logistically really interesting things about the placenta is it's a tissue that we can study at a molecular basis in humans and animals, right? So I don't know what you know, if any of you have uh, had children, then you have this big bucket of a placenta that comes out. And often, uh, it just either goes in the fridge or goes is disposed of. Now, banking that tissue is becoming a very, very big deal. And, and I'll show you um, uh, some data to just like, we can predict neurodevelopmental outcomes by doing some epigenetic analyses of that tissue. And so if you're thinking about early intervention, if you're thinking about who is most at risk, this is a, a really important tissue to con uh, consider. Uh, then, of course, there is the postnatal environment. So it may not come as a surprise that if there is distress prenatally, there is also going to be continued distress during the postnatal period. And distress prenatally is going to affect the neural circuits that regulate maternal behavior. Even placental function, how well it's doing, how the epigenetic tone of the placenta can influence the maternal brain. So there's a lot of pathways. It's not a simple story. And epigenetics can play uh, a number of roles in predicting infant development through these pathways. OK, I'll start with the example of prenatal stress. So prenatal stress, of course, means many things to different people. We have prenatal st stress being defined as depressed mood, as anxiety, as exposure to a stressor, as perception of stressor. So it is a very broad and, and vast literature. But I'd say some of the consistent findings from this literature are that there's an extremely high risk of prematurity amongst women who are stressed during their pregnancy. There is lower birth weight. There is an increased stress response in infants born to stress mothers. And this is all often referred to as stress programming or glucocorticoid programming. So there's a multi-generational um, uh, transmission of stress. And of course, ultimately, this leads to differences in risk of depression and anxiety. Now, we can't go around stressing mothers prenatally because that's not really ethical. Um, there are a lot of women out there who are stressed during pregnancy, and, and we, we can examine those, uh, those women and the trajectories of their offspring. We can, however, go into the lab and look at the effects of stress in rodents um, and then see whether the same effects that we see in rodent models where we've manipulated stress levels are apparent in human studies where we monopolize on the differences in stress that we see in the population. Now, if we expose a pregnant rat to chronic variable stress, we're going to see widespread uh, epigenetic and gene expression changes in the placenta. And, um, and I'm going to highlight a few genes that we see particularly affected um, as they, these will translate well to humans. So the first is the NR3C1 gene. So back when I was uh, doing my PhD at McGill University, the glucocorticoid receptor was really the focus of a lot of the research going on in epigenetics, right? The glucocorticoid receptor is incredibly important. Its expression in your hippocampus is what helps you to downregulate your stress response, right? You want to be able to launch a stress response because that is the way your body prepares for a threatening environment. But what you'd like to be able to do is turn that stress off, right? Turn it off and get back to baseline. And your glucocorticoid receptors in your hippocampus are central to that role. They help you to downregulate your stress, get back to baseline. And what we see is that the glucocorticoid receptor is ex a decrease in expression in the male placenta as a function of stress. So this is a sex-specific effect. Males are particularly vulnerable. Males are particularly vulnerable to almost every form of prenatal adversity. We're not entirely sure why. We think it's to do with some of the developmental timings of sexual differentiation that go on prenatally versus postnatally in males and females. But we can see this at the level of behavior. We can see it at the level of gene expression and epigenetics. Now, another gene that I'll highlight is the 11-beta-HSD2 gene. So this is a mouthful 
for the name of an enzyme that inactivates stress hormone, right? So another way to manage your stress is to inactivate stress hormone. And we have lots of this enzyme in the placenta because the placenta is the buffer, right? We're hoping that it's gonna buffer the fetus from any high stress hormone in maternal circulation that might come across to the, uh, to the fetus. And by having 11 beta HSD in the placenta, we, we serve that kind of buffering role. But the problem is it gets decreased when mothers are stressed, right? So stress goes up in the mothers, 11 beta HSD2 goes down, lots of stress hormone go into the fetal compartment, program the, the offspring's brain. Now, a third gene I'll highlight is DNMT1. This is a DNA methyltransferase. This is basically the enzyme that goes around methylating DNA. Now, you need this enzyme. If you lack this enzyme, you would not survive. You need to be able to shut genes off. Um, and especially, you need to do, be able to do this developmentally. But um, what stress is doing is suppressing this enzyme. And so that may have implications genome-wide for what's going on epigenetically. Now, the male-specific effect of prenatal adversity that we see in our rodent model is also something we see in humans. So uh, if we look at three-month-old infants born to depressed mothers, they have uh, increased glucocorticoid or NR3C1 DNA methylation in their saliva samples, right? So their NR3C1 gene has been shut off. We don't know what's going on in the hippocampus because we can't really look, but we think that that will probably also be present in the hippocampus, compromising the stress reactivity of these infants. So we have maternal depression, selective kind of suppressing genes that might help those infants to moderate their stress response. Now, in a, a, a longitudinal study where we recruited pregnant mothers, we were also interested in other epigenetic changes in genes associated with perception of stress. So clinical depression is quite a severe uh, condition. But here in, this, uh, in, in one of our studies, we looked at perceived psychosocial stress. So we didn't measure anything about their, we did measure things about their clinical state, but to be honest, perceived psychosocial stress is the best predictor of a lot of epigenetic outcomes and a lot of outcomes in offspring. Now that suggests that there's something that we don't know about the biology of perception of stress. It's such a powerful uh, force in shaping our biology. But what we find is that mothers who have higher perceived psychosocial stress have higher DNA methylation of the 11 beta HSD2 gene in their placenta. So higher stress, they're shutting off the gene that metabolizes uh, glucocorticoids, and they're exposing the fetus to more uh, stress hormone. So very similar to what we're seeing in the rodents, we're seeing this linked to uh, psychosocial stress in the mothers. Now, a really amazing development, I think, in the field of neuroscience is the ability to do neuroimaging in the fetal time period, right? So you can do fMRI prenatally, because you now they have the, all the tools necessary to correct for all the motion uh, artifacts that occur. We didn't have that when we started this study, but what we did have is measures of autonomic reactivity, which is a really good prenatal indicator of how well neurodevelopment is going. And what we found is that the higher the DNA methylation of this gene in the placenta, the 11 beta HSC2 gene, the poorer the neurodevelopmental outcomes in the babies, right? So they're, they're showing some poor uh, trajectories already at the fetal stage before they're born um, due to the uh, link to these epigenetic changes. And if we do some mediation analysis, we find that that, sit, that one epigenetic change in that one particular gene is actually a significant mediator between psychosocial stress and fetal neurodevelopment. So if we, all, we now have the full genome, epigenome um, of these mothers and can really kind of look at the patterns uh, in this epigenome that are predicted by stress and what that means for the babies and their outcomes. And now the babies are um, three or four years old and so we'll be following them to see uh, what this predicts long term. Now, in addition to stress, 
we've been very interested in how other steroid hormones during the prenatal period can shape neurodevelopment. Uh, one particular um, steroid hormone is testosterone. So there's a lot of interest in prenatal testosterone and what it does to the social brain. And so there's some very interesting theories uh, regarding um, autism related to prenatal exposure to testosterone. We know from studies of amniocentesis that higher testosterone levels in utero protect poor vocabulary size, poor social cognition in infants. And, uh, but amniocentesis now, because of cell-free DNA sampling that goes on prenatally, is going to become obsolete. So there needs to be less invasive ways for us to capture what's going on in terms of this particular hormonal component of, of uh, the prenatal period. And so what we've been looking at is maternal testosterone, cord blood testosterone, and what's going on in terms of gene expression in the placenta, particularly of enzymes that um, metabolize testosterone, and how that predicts neurodevelopmental outcomes. And particularly, we're interested in aromatase, which converts testosterone to estradiol and may buffer uh, the infants from high levels of maternal uh, testosterone. Now, our theoretical framework for looking at this was that high testosterone would be a, a poor, predict poor to, to developmental trajectories, right? So we want to avoid that. The one way to avoid that is have a mother with very low levels of testosterone. But if you have high testosterone, you want higher levels of these enzymes that buffer the baby from the testosterone. So high risk would be associated with high maternal testosterone and elevated um, and reduced levels of placenta aurora or aromatase expression, both which, which are important for metabolizing testosterone. And thus far, it seems that those hypotheses are supported by uh, the data that we're collecting from mothers who've given birth at Presbyterian Hospital and Columbia University. So I, I wanted to highlight um, some of this data, particularly focusing on conditions that lead to increased maternal testosterone, including preeclampsia and polycystic ovary syndrome. So we have in the total in this sample, we have about 700 births. Um, we have a fair number that come under the category of having these two conditions. We verify that these two conditions lead to increased not only in maternal testosterone, but in fetal testosterone levels measured from cord blood. If we look at autism spectrum disorder risk using a social difficulties, a social communication questionnaire, what we find is in mothers where there is high testosterone, you have higher scores on this measure, indicating poor social communication. Uh, if we look at males and females uh, who were given birth to by our, our no uh, condition versus our conditions that high, have high testosterone, we find that there is heightened risk of uh, autism spectrum disorder with these conditions, particularly in males, uh, which might mesh well with the higher risk of males to this disorder in particular. Now, stress may also be a significant player in predicting what's going on in terms of in utero testosterone. We've recently been looking at how stress affects the expression of genes in the placenta that are important for predicting testosterone levels. And basically what stress seems to be doing is masculinizing aromatase profiles in females. So they're suppressing them to the levels of males. We don't know exactly what that means for autism risk, but it does suggest that when we're thinking about risk trajectories, we need to think about males and females, how they're reacting to stress, and how that's affecting the hormonal environment in utero. Now, another uh, component of the prenatal environment are exposures to toxins that we might be exposed to in a variety of ways. And, and probably many of you have heard about B BPA, uh, bisphenol A, which is used in the manufacture of plastics. And uh, certainly, it's a very contentious issue uh, in the United States, probably here as well. BPA is used in the manufacture of plastics. When you drink out of plastics, you ingest BPA. It is probably not a great thing in the long term for your health. Um, now, the problem is replacing bisphenols is very challenging, and we'll talk a little bit about what the, the state of things are. But we were interested in bisphenol A and what it might mean for the developing uh, baby and for long-term outcomes. Now, working for the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, who've had decades of work on how toxins affect uh, neurodevelopmental trajectories, 
we found that boys are particularly susceptible to the effects of in utero BPA. So mothers with high prenatal BPA levels have boys that evince more emotionally aggressive um, behavior. Girls are actually seem to be buffered from the effects of BPA, at least at this age group. Now, I, I suspect as we move along and, the, and um, these children grow older, we're going to see some effects in both males and females. But certainly at this age point, which was about seven years of age, we see boys uh, more susceptible. Now, the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health were interested in, in whether epigenetic mechanisms might be an explanation for how BPA exposure might be tied to these long-term outcomes. And so we started looking at a number of epigenetic changes um, in uh, various tissues, um, including uh, human cord blood tissues of these children. And we found that one particular gene stood out, and that was the brain-derived neurotrophic factor gene. So that's a mouthful for a gene that is central to neuroplasticity, plasticity in general. But we know that the social brain is highly determinant on the expression of this gene for plastic changes. It's important for social behavior. It's important for learning and memory. And what happens in males who've had high BPA exposure is it becomes epigenetically silent. So the BPA is methylating the DNA of this gene, shutting it off, um, and this may have a severe repercussions for, uh, for the brain and behavior of these infants. Now, BPA and other toxins and pollutants in the environment co-occurs with a number of other social determinants of health. And when you're trying to make policy recommendations, this is a big problem because the environmental health people say, no, that's not our problem. It's because of the social environments they're exposed to. The social environment people say, no, you've got to go back to the environmental people. Uh, and so there's a standoff. Um, and so it's nice to be able to replicate these findings in an animal model. And so what we did is we took mice, we exposed them prenatally to bisphenol A, and we found the exact same effect. So the males in the brain, the males who'd had high levels of in utero exposure to BPA, had higher DNA methylation of this gene. It was epigenetically silenced, and this probably accounted for a lot of the learning and memory deficits that they, they had. Now, BPA affects so many things, and it's an interesting uh, toxin to work with. A lot of the, um, the governments and uh, agencies in the US want us to stop working on it because they don't really want to do anything about it, so why study it? But uh, that's not really a logical reason to stop studying things. Um, and uh, some other outcomes that I thought would be interesting to, just to discuss briefly are the way BPA affects aggressive behavior. So uh, we, f we found in humans that high BPA increases aggressive behavior in males. This is some data from an animal model where we exposed mice to BPA, and we saw that higher levels of BPA increased aggressive behavior in actually both males and females. So there, this might be due to the developmental timing in, males versus, uh, in rodents versus humans of sexual differentiation. But what was very interesting about this effect is though, uh, though we, we did get this effect directly from BPA, it could be modulated by quality of the mother-infant interaction. And so that started getting us thinking about the postnatal moderating influences on the brain uh, that may affect these trajectories. Now, hormones, endocrine disruptors, nutrition, these are all going to affect circuits within the maternal brain. And so uh, this is an area of research that, uh, that I'm quite passionate about because we often overlook uh, the mothers in thinking about how these exposures affect developmental outcomes. Um, we know that there are many circuits within the maternal brain that are important for caregiving activity that can be influenced by endocrine exposures like BPA, uh, particularly the dopamine circuit, right? So the dopamine circuit that we, we've heard about dopamine today, dopamine is so important for motivated behavior, right? And though we've talked about dopamine in the context of addiction and compulsion, it's also really important for the reward p that mothers feel when they interact with their child. And an explanation of why caregiving continues, um, even under adverse experiences. Now, we've been very interested in BPA uh, and how it affects the mother's brain. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of 
a lot of companies are making BPA-free plastics. And you might think, oh, well, that solves that problem. But actually, it just creates another problem. Because what they're doing is replacing BPA with other bisphenols, BPF and BPS particularly. So what's happening in the population is all our BPA levels are going down, and our BPF and BPS levels are going up. But we don't know what those compounds do. So now we have to start all over with all of the bisphenols and show that they have a, a lot of effects. So we've been, we've been starting a study looking at how mothers and infants are affected by their exposure to these compounds. Um, and in particular, we're interested in how it affects the way they respond to infant cues. Now, um, the, the field of work looking at how mothers' brains react to infant stimuli usually involves presenting pictures of their own versus another infant. Most mothers have a higher neural response to their own infant. Most mothers also much prefer a happy infant than a sad infant, okay? So that is probably intuitive. Um, now, what we're concerned about is that under conditions of stress, under conditions of endocrine disruptor, maybe we aren't going to see these effects. Maybe every baby looks like a sad baby to mothers who've had these high levels of exposure. So now we're doing neuroimaging to determine what the effect on these neural circuits is and to suggest interventions that might help ameliorate some of the BPA effects on both mothers and infants. So that, of course, brings us to the effects of mothering. Now, uh, much of the work on epigenetics is rooted in this. I have to say it took many, many, many years to convince people that there could be epigenetic changes induced by maternal care. And it seems funny to think about it now because everyone's like, yeah, of course it does. Um, but it took a lot of work to convince, uh, convince of this truth. Um, and it is certainly the case. And you can see this in humans. You can see this in animals. Um, uh, and as Jean told us uh, about the licking and grooming behavior, tactile stimulation is a really central part of this across species, right? Don't go licking your babies, um, but hug them, right? When I moved to New York uh, to start at Columbia University, someone said, oh, can you come to our fundraiser? We're going to talk about your work. I was like, great. Um, but then I realized um, that they were advocating mothers to lick their babies. And I was like, no, 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 no. Very, very bad translation. So that's not, that's not what I'm advocating. But there can be a lot of touch. Uh, that goes on that is beneficial to infants. And maternal care can have genome-wide effects on the ep epigenome with implications. Now, one group that benefits quite considerably from this touch that we've heard about already from Jean today is the premature infant, right? So they've, they've already had exposure to adversity. You're not premature for nothing. There's usually stress. There's immune activation. There's exposure to a number of other factors. And so a group I work with at Columbia University at the Nurture Science Program has been using touch to improve neurodevelopmental trajectories, right? And it's a combined massage type touch with olfactory sharing, right, between the mother and infant. Um, and what they're finding is very significant improvements in neurodevelopment. They have the, the the babies in the little EEG caps, and they show remarkable improvements. And these kids, when they get older, they show uh, less risk factors in terms of autism spectrum disorder as well. So uh, premature infants are very high risk for ASD. Um, and these kind of interventions implemented you know, at the start of life can be very important. And it's really restoring some of what is lost but also trying to help shape developmental trajectories and, and offset these early adversities. Now, another epigenetic outcome that can occur because of life experiences is what's called epigenetic age acceleration. So this is a very new area in epigenetics and one that I think is very fascinating because basically it's a marker in your epigenome that basically tells us how well you're aging biologically. Okay, so we can sequence your genome, we can look at the DNA methylation patterns, and we can calculate an age that that pattern tells us you are. But sometimes that age is not matched well with your chronological age, right? So if you are age accelerated, usually it's your, you've got a 
epigenetic age that's much higher than your chronological age. There's been a lot of interest in epigenetic age acceleration. There's more and more work showing that prenatal adversity can accelerate epigenetic aging, that stress, that exposure to disease can accelerate epigenetic aging. And we see these epigenetic age accelerations in mothers um, in our studies. So we see some that are doing fine, some that are showing indications of biological wear and tear. And I should say, epigenetic age acceleration predicts mortality, even controlling for chronological age. So it's some additional information about your biological wear and tear uh, that we can measure using the epigenome. But even the placenta is registering these epigenetic age differences, right? So we, we have a study. Now, the placenta should be zero, right? You can do all sorts of corrections for gestational age, but the placenta should be zero. But we have some placentas that their epigenetic age is four. So that means that the biology attached to that infant is already aging. And there's more and more interesting in the aging literature on what happens early in life. What happens in early in life is really going to set the trajectory of aging um, in very, very important ways. Um, and that can be very depressing unless we think about how we can change that. Now, aging, you know, when I go to aging meetings, they don't want to hear about aging going backwards, because that's not aging then. If, if we can go backwards and age, then it's not really aging. But we'll forget about that and just think about how we can restore our biology in ways that will promote a happy, healthy, uh, long lifestyle. So I just wanted to highlight some work from uh, an intervention program that my, uh, some colleagues of mine uh, did at, uh, in Georgia uh, called the Strong African Americans Families Program. And this was a family level intervention working with youths and their parents uh, to decrease drug use, to encourage affiliative parenting uh, interactions uh, uh, in, these, in this population. And they measured epigenetic age acceleration in this population. So what they found was that, in many cases, high parental depressive symptoms predicted epigenetic age acceleration. So the parent's depression, which is associated with less touch, less positive um, interactions with the infants, was predicting epigenetic age acceleration. Epigenetic age acceleration decelerated if they were in the intervention. The intervention focused on promoting better communication between the parents, better parenting practices, and in particular, the reduction in harsh parenting, the reduction in aggressive encounters between the parent and infant was important for this deceleration. So thinking about how we can set these trajectories early in life is going to be very important for not just predicting health and the early stages of development, but aging later on. So there are many, many ways in which epigenetic variation can be induced, right? So everything you can think about in terms of the experience of the physical world can have an epigenetic effect. I think one of, you know, when you're doing studies in humans, um, smoking is usually the control, right? So you can, if you can't see an effect with smoking, then there's something wrong with your study because smoking has huge, huge epigenetic effects in infants. Um, but it's not just the physical world. It's not just pesticides and toxins and what we eat. It's the social world. It's the positive affiliative encounters between mothers and infants that are going to shape the epigenome and shape these developmental trajectories. Um, and while there has been a substantial bias on thinking about negative interactions, uh, there's more and more work thinking about what promotes resilience, what are the positive life experiences that we could use to shift these trajectories. Now, that's what happens within your own lifespan. One of the interesting um, areas of research that pops up when you start talking about epigenetics is multi-generational effects. Now, part of that's confusion over the terms genetic and epigenetic, because there is the term genetic in epigenetic. And so often, people think that it must mean that it's something that is absolutely heritable, just like genes are. Now, that's not necessarily the case. But still, it's got people thinking, well, could there be other things that are transmitted across generations? How would that work? What would be the implications for offspring development? 
Now, we know that there are a number of mother's experience, of grand maternal experiences that can shape offspring development. And there's increasing focus, for example, on the use site, on the use of in vitro fertilization, on the, um, the exposure to hormones uh, pr uh, prior to conception in mothers, and how that might lead to epigenetic variation in offspring. And there's certainly a strong support in the animal literature for these effects. As I've mentioned, the prenatal environment, the postnatal maternal behavior that offspring receive receive um, uh, can affect offspring development, and these effects can be carried forward across multiple generations. Now, what's I think more um, fascinating to a lot of the people in the field is that fathers can do this too. Um, now, fathers, of course, can engage in caregiving, and uh, a lot of the basic research has avoided fathers because in most rodents, the fathers are not taking care of the offspring in any way. And you normally remove them from any contact with the offspring for various morbid reasons. Um, but, uh, but in species that are biparental, fathers can have the same influence that mothers can. They provide tactile stimulation. They provide nurturing experiences for the young that have epigenetic effects. But what's more fascinating, I suppose, for fathers is that they don't even need to have contact with you to influence you epigenetically. And that brings us to germline effects. Now, the germline refers to the oocyte or the sperm. So in the case of our fathers, it's the sperm. And the idea here is that as males pass through life, their sperm is exposed to the same environments the rest of them is, and that those sperm acquire an epigenetic mark. Now, this happens. This is not debatable. It just it happens. We see, we see evidence for this in humans and animals. Um, the question is, or I suppose the challenge is, that it's assumed that we start off a blank slate, right? We get our genes from our moms, we get our genes from our dads, and we erase everything else. But apparently the erasure is not complete. So we inherit epigenetic baggage from the sperm, right? So if the fathers have acquired epigenetic changes in their sperm, it, some of it may get passed on to the offspring. And through mechanisms that copy both DNA and DNA methylation, all of these epigenetic marks get copied in the offspring that then pass it down to their offspring. So there's increasing speculation that multi-generational effects can be triggered by one generation's exposure to a toxin, to different nutritional environments, to trauma. So there's a lot of work looking at this in, in the realm of historical trauma and stress and thinking about the pathways and through which epigenetics kind of cement these traumas and lead to multi-generational effects. But I would say one important um, element of this, and I, oh, I'll just highlight as well, that uh, when we're thinking about genes and their accounting for behavior, we often talk about heritability. So heritability comes up all the time in psychology. We talk about, oh, how heritable is this? It's absolute nonsense. But um, people debate it anyway. But there's this now that we can actually sequence the genome, it's very clear that there's a huge disparity between what we can account for by actually measuring the genome in terms of what we think is heritable, the percentage heritability of a trait. So we th think of th some traits as being highly heritable. But it, you'll be hard pressed to find enough genes in the genome to account for all of this. Um, and so epigenetic inheritance, the transmission of epigenetic marks, may account for some of this missing heritability. So this is getting geneticists very upset, it's getting evolutionary biologists very interested. Um, and so we'll see what happens in the end. But I think, I think it's important to note that when we're thinking about environmental exposures and their effects, or positive environments, and their effects. We need to take a multi-generational perspective because effects might be modest in one generation but really accumulate as we go along. Now, important to note, although much of the experimental work on mothers and fathers separates them, right? We're going to study what mothers do and how they influence development. We're going to study what fathers do and influence their development. Reproduction is really about bringing mothers and fathers together. And we've done a lot of studies in mice showing that even if fathers are exposed to severe stressors, and we know that some of those stressors can epigenetically influence offspring through the germline, mothers can offset that effect, right? So we can bring them back in, 
if we look at the social dynamic between the mothers and, and fathers, we have a better idea of predicting offspring development. So I think this is a, an area that needs a little bit more attention in the field because really we need to think about the social dynamics, right? It's not just one influence, but those influences are occurring in a context. So as we go through development, we acquire this epigenetic variation, right? And it is a dynamic process, it, but it is leading us down different trajectories. The earlier we intercede and shape this epigenome, the better we can end up in terms of phenotypic outcomes and better social behavior and better uh, health. And I think bringing epigenetics into these questions of uh, early developmental experience is very, very important. So for many, for many, many decades, we've lived within this kind of gene-centric view where genes work out and are deterministic about behavior. What epigenetics offers is to describe the dialogue that goes on between environments and the genes, right? It's a, it's a conversation, right? Genes may have an influence, but there is, there is a conversation going on between the environments to which that genome is experiencing uh, and that genome. And so thinking kind of about the layers of information uh, that build our biology is very important, especially in, ter in terms of thinking about plasticity. And so this new kind of dynamic epigenetic perspective is really, I think, helping us to think about the dynamic and interactive nature of our biology, right? So it's, it's very, very different from a deterministic view. Things are probabilistic. There is room for plasticity, room for intervention. We can change these trajectories quite significantly. It also helps us to think more broadly about inheritance, right? And so we are not kind of driven by our ancestors' experience. There is a lot more going on uh, than just the genes we inherited. And so thinking about multi-generational processes and how they can be offset will be very important going forward for thinking about how we address differences in trajectories in terms of social behavior and the brain. Okay, with that, I'd just like to, of course, acknowledge all the people that I've worked with over the years. I'd particularly like to point out our whole community's whole health initiative that the university has invested in that will really allow us to work with at-risk communities, to think about programming, to think about interventions that can help ameliorate some of the biological burden that people come with because of their ancestry, because of their circumstances, and to change those trajectories. So thank you very much. Thank you.